All right, welcome everyone. It is officially two o'clock, so we're gonna get started with the session. This is sailing through your next submission, publication advice from the editors of AM ENT. This is meant to be kind of a panel where we wanna ask you know, and answer questions. I have a whole list of questions I created, like a whole list of them that can fill out the whole time. But what's more important are the ones that come to your mind. So feel free kind of throughout the session to just you know, raise your hand, go over the microphone, mostly so that we can record and everyone can hear you well. And ask your questions away because you have, you know, editors who span, I think, nine or ten journals, which is pretty cool. And you have their ears to answer any question, any question you have. Um, maybe not, you know, a specific paper. You're like, hey, why didn't you accept that? But we can try. <laughs> and so with that in mind, I figure we could start off by just introducing ourselves and kind of our role in the context of, you know, peer review and editor editorship. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm Lainey Yaris. I'm at Oregon Health and Science University, and I'm on the editorial board for both Academic Emergency Medicine Education and Training and um, the journal AEM. And I also serve as one of the deputy editors for the Journal of Graduate Medical Education. Super excited to talk about this topic and answer all of your questions. Please uh, feel free to ask away. Hi everybody, I'm Jamie Jordan, also on the editorial board for AEM ENT, as well as BMC Medical Education, and a guest editor for the West Gem Cord Educational Supplement. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Susan Promise. I'm from Penn State University, and serve as the editor in chief for AEM ENT, and also as a reviewer for multiple different journals. I'm glad you're all here today. And then I'm Mike Gottlieb. I'm at Rush in Chicago. I'm editor on Annals of Emergency Medicine, AM ENT, of course, uh, uh, AGEM, WestGEM, GMIR. Um, I'm pretty active in like peer review and a lot of stuff as well. And I'm happy to uh, you know, work with this amazing panel and lend insights and mostly just moderate and answer questions as they arise through it. And so, kind of as a starting question, as we think through kind of the, you know, arc of our projects. It all starts with a good question, right? You have to have a good question. So how do you come up with a good question? How do you find out the question that's going to be the one that you think is going to get published? I don't know. I, I, think, I think one of the most important things is probably read a lot so you kind of know what's out there, what's, what people care about. And then I think follow what you care about, what you're interested in, and that you're going to you know, really put some passion into. I think the other thing when you're trying to come up with a good question is, um, you know, not only read a lot, but talk to a lot of different people. Because you don't want it just to be interesting to you, right? You want it to be interesting to a large audience. Um, and, and try to align whatever it is you're working on, um, again, and find a journal that it'll fit with. Uh, I think that's another important piece to making sure you can get your area of interest published. I agree with both of those comments, and I think beyond the foundation of is it interesting and is it novel, the most important thing is to really make a strong argument for why that question needs to be answered, and even more importantly, how this is going to change our practice, how this is going to change our practice as educators or education researchers. And that last piece, I think, is probably the one that I see most often neglected in the formulation of the question process. I love a lot of really great pearls in there. I want to expand on a couple of them. One was um, very early on, kind of Jamie mentioned, read more, right? And we hear that a lot when we teach our residents. We're like, you should just read more. But it's not just reading more, it's how you read more. And there's some degree of reading for content as you get familiar with the field. But what I've started doing is, when I read studies, I also read for how they write. I'm like, oh, that's a clever way of framing that. The introduction format, they use a problem gap hook format. They, you know, they frame their discussion interestingly. This is where they put their, your, their conceptual framework. Spoiler alert, we're coming to that next. Um, it's interesting. I learned from that. And I'm like, wow, that's a really clever way of doing it. So I actually read for writing style now, too, which has allowed me to improve how I write. Um, and I, I like the other piece, too, is in terms of like phone, phone a friend. Get an outside opinion. We're all so close to our projects. We get so vested in them. It's nice to have someone who's going to be that contrarian and be like, have you thought about this? The pre-reviewer, too, who's going to say, eh, I don't really think that's going to work. Have you thought about that? And get that before you launch your project. So one of the things being that we're, you know, looking at AMNT, it's an education-focused journal. And a common 
you know, at least a common error I faced in my first number of publications or submissions into education-based journals is they said, where is your conceptual framework? Over and over again. No doubt a reviewer will say that comment. So first of all, what is a conceptual framework and how do I incorporate it? So a conceptual framework is really a theory or a model for how things work. And the way that I think about this is that it's your own personal understanding of this phenomenon that you're studying. So for example, if you're studying feedback, your framework has to do a lot with what you understand about feedback and the assumptions you're making. And it's really important in the process of writing your paper, usually in the introductions and the methods, to mis make this explicitly clear to your reader, because that's how readers know, first of all, if they're interested in your study, and then beyond that, how to build upon your study and whether the results will apply to them. And let me ask you one other kind of related question is, where does it go? Does it go in the intro, the methods, the discussion, each of the above? Mm -hmm. I, know, I know I internally, I still at times struggle with that. I'm like, where should I be putting this? What's your take? I say for sure in the introduction, and then it will depend if you put it in the methods versus in the discussion or both. It really may end up in all those different areas of your paper, um, depending on what the conceptual framework is and how much background you need to give to your readers. All right, and so, and again, I encourage any questions you have, again, feel free to kind of come and, you know, up to the mic and add them in. So one of the things, though, that we hear a lot is write it up, right? If you're gonna do a project, you might as well write it up, get your credit for it, right? And I feel like it seems good in theory. I wanna get credit for the work I'm doing. And so I'm gonna write up the given project, the course I've done, um, but, half the time ends up being something that you put the work into and it doesn't end up being something publishable. So what pearls and pitfalls do you have thinking now about a project that you wanted to write up that you wish you'd known for program evaluation or for trying to write up a project that you've either are planning to do or have done? I guess I'll start. I think, I think it's really important to plan early. I've definitely been one of those folks who tried to get something published at the end and, and figured out that there were major fatal flaws that I couldn't overcome. So I think really planning ahead of how you're going to disseminate this work in one way or another and getting, if you don't have the expertise, getting some mentorship or some expert advice about how to do so right from the get-go so you can be strategic in your planning and your carrying out of your project, um, including the dissemination aspect. So I love it. I mean, it's like any other study, right? If you consult your statistician after you've done the work, they're like, well, it's great. I would have done these seven other things that you didn't collect. And I think the same thing applies to our projects. The write it up is often the thing we hear when we did the study. And we should really almost be internalizing this to some degree, right? Is that if I'm going to do a project, well, first of all, is it a good study question? So using out the excellent points that Lainey brought up in terms of laying out like you know your finer criteria. And then saying, all right, what do I need to collect to make sure I'm successful when I'm going to actually write up? How do I make sure that I, you know, I'm best set up for successful publication? And it almost leads itself into, what do I assess? Like, we often kind of send these surveys after a course, and how do I best optimize that? How do, what outcomes should I collect? And how do I make sure that I capture the most useful ones to increase my chance of actually publishing this at the back end? Yeah, to kind of uh, build off that, I think that when a lot of times in my career when I've heard, oh, you should write that up, it was um, meant to be um, advice coming from a very good place, but it actually wasn't good advice for the format that was being suggested. And I like to reframe that as, how can you get multiple wins for all of this important work that you're doing? And if you're doing an educational project, I think it's really important to be scholarly about it, to do it in a, a rigorous way, to disseminate it and talk about it with the community, but that might not be writing it up for a journal. That might be another form of scholarship. It might be publishing in a curriculum repository or thinking about um, it leading to doing some kind of a review or synthesis work, but um, I think choose carefully in terms of when you decide to try to turn an education project into research as much as I'm an advocate for both because our time is so precious and not all education projects are well suited to the type of write-ups that we think about when we're reading through our journals. 
just going to add one more point for planning early. I think having that goal, you know, are you setting out to create a curricular innovation? Is this going to be a program evaluation? Is this going to be a research study? Knowing what type of scholarship you're intending to disseminate this as from the beginning will, will really help direct how you perform your activities going through it. I, I love that. And so let's go another direction. Let's start with a survey of the audience. Raise your hand if you've done a survey study. Wow, that was like 90%. <laughs> All right. So pretty common, right? We see them. How often do you see one? Who's seen a survey study in the listserv in the past month? All right. So we receive them. We see them all the time, right? This is something that's common. Um, when you think about your last survey study and you first came, or maybe the first survey study you're going to do, who here thought it was going to be pretty easy when you came up with the concept the very first time you did it? You all thought it was going to be hard? All right. I, I, the first one I did, I thought it was going to be really easy. It seemed easy in theory. I sent out a survey. Like, this is great. I don't have to recruit any patients. And then I actually did it. And I was like, wow, this is really hard. I'm struggling to get response rates. I'm struggling to you know, try to figure out how to even use this data. It always seems good in theory. We use this a lot. It's very common. But we struggle with it. And the majority of them do not get published. So let's figure out how to fix that. Looking back on survey studies, the stuff you've done, the stuff you've read, what are some pearls and pitfalls to make sure we're more successful with them? I'm going to say the pearl that I would offer the group is have other people take your survey, trial it before you actually send it out to multiple people. Because sometimes you're just so close to the material that you can't see a very obvious flaw to other people, especially when you give options that people have to pick from and the options don't work for everyone. Um, so again, trial it with others before you move forward. Yeah, I think to, to Susan's point about you know, really piloting, you really want to describe it and be thoughtful and deliberate about the development of your survey instrument and make sure that you're collecting and then also telling your reader what sort of validity evidence that you gathered in support of use of that survey. I agree. And also, um, I've, I've sat in multiple rooms where there have been statements made about, like, we will not take survey studies, not with this group of editors, but with other groups of editors. And I, my personal opinion is, just like other methods, survey is neither a good method nor a bad method. The question is really, is this a good method for what you care about? And so if you care about participant perceptions in a way that can actually be quantified or qualitatively explained on a survey, a survey can be a great method, but it still requires a lot of work to do it the correct way. So I would think about really matching your question to the method, whether it's a survey or any other form of data collection that you decide to use. That's such a great kind of overarching almost concept is, what are you trying to study and how does that question align with the methods? Because you can, you can survey anything, but is survey the right model? If I want to understand, if we think about a survey study, right, we're often trying to gather this information from someone. And if I want to understand maybe their lived experience going through something, like how, what's the experience of performing procedures as a first year, you know, resident? Well, I could use a survey, I can get some information from there, but it's going to be superficial, it might be a couple lines, right? If I really want to delve there, maybe qualitative is a better method to actually interview them and get much more dense information. Or maybe I want to understand the um, distribution of procedures across a variety of different learners. I could send them a survey and maybe a third of them respond and I have a skewed sample set. Or maybe I do something more quantitative and I reach out to the residency program directors and get that data directly. There's different ways of answering your questions. But there's other times where maybe the survey is really that best method. If we want to gather you know, individual site data from each site, it's going to be really hard to get a DUA to share all that information across there. But I can probably get a survey where they can give me this information. If I, for example, want to look at um, distributions of scheduling or parental leave policies, I may have better luck getting it through a survey method. So mirroring it to the questions can be really helpful. So if you're going to do the survey study, I think there's certain words that um, will almost universally have a response from a reviewer. One of them is if you mix up the term assessment and evaluation. And another one is saying the word validated survey. I know I've said it in the past. I know I've seen it a lot. So 
why don't people like the term validated survey? And what is validity evidence? It is, it is a term that evokes a lot of emotions. <laughs> Um, really, if you, um, kind of the current thinking is that there's no such thing as a validated instrument. And that every time you use the instrument, you should collect evidence that supports its use and its score interpretation for your specific context. Unless an instrument was created for the exact same context that you will be using it in, and that's been published, you really um, need to demonstrate additional validity evidence. And I think about validity evidence like when you're writing a term paper back in the day, you're really trying to kind of like pull together an argument, pulling from different evidence sources to support your um, view or your opinion. And um, for validity evidence for an instrument, you're collecting multiple types of validity evidence. It's the five types are content validity, response process, internal structure, relation to other variables, and consequences. And you're really collecting as much as you can or as much as you think is useful for this project to demonstrate to your readers that this instrument is actually measuring what it intends to measure, that the respondents' responses mean what I think that they do, and that we can kind of trust these results, that they mean something. And there are a couple of different frameworks out there that you can refer to that I find really helpful to kind of have in front when I'm trying to supply this evidence. So Messick's, like Lady mentioned, also Kane. Uh, I'm sure there's other ones, but probably those are the two most common that I think we see. And so you know, I, I think that that's one of those things that I agree. It, is, it speaks to really the false dichotomization. Right? When you say it's a validated survey, you're implying it's a non-off switch. It's either validated or it's not. And we're, you know, we see this in the emergency department, right? If you're perk negative, you're not actually a zero risk of PE, you're less than 2% risk. Your risk stratification that we see for ACS, the risk stratification we see across almost every disease process, nothing is perfect. And the same thing exists for validity evidence. You can ha have high amounts of it, significant, you can have less, but it's never a perfect thing because there's always some difference. The, stu the study tool that I use at Rush, if I use it among Rush EM residents and I try to use the exact same study tool among, you know, OHSU faculty, the tool is the same, but it's a different population and it may not have been have it sufficient validity evidence for that population. And I ask a whole bunch of questions about that were derived and set up and structured around residents as opposed to maybe senior faculty. The questions may not match, they may not fit, they may not have the as strong validity evidence. So that's where like that a lot of I feel like to me that comes from is that sense of trying to create a false dichotomization, like it's an on off switch, but it's not, it's a dimmer and how comfortable you are with how low the lights run on that dimmer. Now you mentioned a lot of really, you know, so there's a lot of different frameworks. I would say MESIC is by far probably the most common. And you mentioned five really big terms really quickly. And I think it, just because survey studies are common enough, and this doesn't apply, by the way, just to surveys, but would one you feel comfortable kind of just delving into like briefly what those terms mean and maybe how you can at least start to demonstrate some of that evidence? <laughs> Uh, content validity is um, do you have the right content on your survey or your instrument, whatever it is. And you can demonstrate that any number of ways, but usually it's literature search, expert opinion. The important thing is that you justify why you included what you included. Response process validity is usually what we're doing when we're piloting. It's um, that uh, concept that I spoke about, like how are people reading these questions? Are they interpreting them the way that I think that they are? What do their responses mean? Um, in addition to piloting, like speaking aloud about the questions with colleagues can be very helpful. Um, internal structure has to do with reliability and also like how many different things are we talking about in this instrument. Um, sometimes we talk about factor analysis or other forms of um, kind of looking at um, rate or reliability in terms of internal structure. Relationship to other variables is if there is, if you're creating an instrument to measure something and there's also another measure and those things are very closely related, then there should be a correlation between the scores using your instrument and the existing instrument. And then consequences is um, really um, kind of nebulous and vague, but it basically means um, what are the consequences of the results of your instrument and do those make sense with what you know? Do they make intuitive sense? So if you are trying to measure like overall readiness for residency with an instrument, does that correlate with like what the CCC's thought? Um, and how does that impact the trainee? That was an awesome summary of a really high, highly complex topic that like people write books about. 
Um, but how I often kind of sometimes look at this from a practical standpoint, because I want to be practical, is each time you go down that list, you're adding more validity evidence, you're strengthening your submission. Steps one and two are very easy to do locally with no resources, with no funding. Step one and two is, did you search the literature and say that you did this, right? Did you identify prior tools and adapt them or explain how you adapted them? Did you talk to experts who, by the way, include you because you are doing the study, you're interested, you've done the lit search, you are an expert. You can say you have content validity, boom, points right away. You could say, all right, response process, did you pilot it with people? And that's actually a big one. I will say the number of times that I thought I had a question written perfectly, it was so clean, so crisp, I piloted it and they completely misinterpreted it. And I had to change the question. It happens a lot. And then you have this data and you're like, I don't know what to do with it. The data's all over the place. I can give you maybe an example here. I asked the question, on average, how many shifts per week do your residents work? Seems clean, pretty crisp, right? That seems very logical. How could that be misinterpreted? Well, what if they have mixed ED and ultrasound shifts or ED and PEM shifts? What if they have some shifts on vacation, let alone if they have to average that across the year? When you talk it through, it may make more sense to do it across, well, how many shifts do a resident work across a given block? Well, how long is a block? Is it 28 days, is it 21 days, is it 30 days? Things that we take for granted because we look at it from our lens, from what we've done, from what we have at our shop, can be completely misconstrued when you talk to others. And so I'm a big fan of think alouds. I'll talk to, I'll actually have the person, a couple people, at least one person who's not in my institution, take, the, take it step by step and tell me how they interpret the question. And it is incredibly useful. If you do that, two things. So you did content, you did response process, you'll be having a much stronger method section than about 95% of the surveys that we probably see, and you'll substantially increase your likelihood of publication. Those two simple things. Three and four, that usually requires a statistician, not always, and it will give you more, more you know, evidence. That's the ones where you're looking at relationship to internal variables and then to external variables. And if you do that, that's great, it'll give you more evidence, but I think if you even do one and two, it will make your study so much better, and that costs you nothing. All right, I have a ton of other questions, but I wanna pause here and say, what questions do you have? I wanna encourage the questions that are on your mind that you always wish you could ask. Hello. So I get that we need conceptual frameworks. That's been kind of beaten into me. As I'm new in this, how do you suggest people go about learning how to identify conceptual frameworks, or what are they, or where do we find them, or how do we figure out which ones to use? Again, I, th I think reading, sometimes there's some nice collections that folks have put out there in terms of the most commonly used conceptual frameworks. Sometimes there isn't something that's already been well established or written about and you sort of have to piece together things from different theories or different things that you've read <coughs> into literature and that's okay too. Um, I think they're, you know, taking advanced coursework in terms of education research methodology is a great source but obviously time intensive. But those are probably some of the, the ways that I've gotten more um, experience and information regarding conceptual frameworks. I want to echo the comment about reading. So if you have an area that you're interested in, I would try to search out research around that topic because I think you'll end up finding examples of conceptual frameworks that will fit for what you're doing. If you're looking to get more um, education in the area, one program you may or may not be aware of is Merck. Medical Education Research Certificate. So the AAMC um, offers that program and they also do it at CORD, so we have Merck at CORD would be another place to go um, and that topic would definitely be covered. And I love that question because conceptual frameworks for me um, were pretty intimidating the first couple times I had to start coming up with them because there's so many. How do I choose the right one? And am I cho if I'm choosing one, am I limiting this? Is someone going to say, well, that's the wrong one? And they may, because there's no perfect conceptual framework. There's different lenses. Some are better. Some are less ideal. But if you come up with one, one that's reasonable and the reviewer finds a better one, great. Now you have a better one. Free pass. And now you know that for the next time. There are ones you can you know, scope down and get narrower and narrower. But at the end of the day, 
there's no perfect one. Looking at some, you know, as, as laid out, looking at some of the existing articles, you actually start to pick up conceptual frameworks for other similar studies, and all of a sudden you'll realize, you know, I started off, for example, a study in, um, I did a study on podcast and the ability to do this driving versus seated, and I started out with that my initial theory is going to be cognitive load theory, and I thought that made sense because how much can we pay attention? That seemed logical, as one I was familiar with. And then I dove a little further and looked at things, and I was like, oh, threaded cognition. Oh, that's clever. That has to do more with the actual pathways and like the types of learning you do. And there's probably other ones I could have used as well. But I wouldn't have come across that had I not done my lit search. And so some of that comes off the lit search, you start to identify these different theories. What other questions you all have? And so as, you know, again, come to the microphone as, you, as things come up, but I want to start to delve in the paper a little bit. Since you all read a lot of papers, um, let's start to break it out. So the intro is the thing that's going to grab the attention, you know, after the abstracts, the first thing you see before you get to the methods. Looking at the intros you've seen in papers, what do you feel like are the kind of key elements and some of the pearls and pitfalls to have an introduction that's catchy, that grabs the reader, that situates the study? I think being catchy is really important. You know, when you read a lot of papers, you want something that people are just going to read the first few sentences and say, oh, this is really interesting to me. And then be concise. Um, try not to use um, a lot of abbreviations. You know, when it comes to a journal, they're going to kick it back to you if you haven't spelled out whatever it is you're trying to talk about. But I think, think about it as, you know, a newspaper article that we don't do that very often, right? We read newspapers anymore. But they have catchy titles. You know, is there something that's going to draw your audience in and say, I want to learn more about that? I also like to see when you know your homework has been done so there's really a clearly articulated problem statement and a review of the literature so that the reader can understand what is known while very also you know clearly specifying what is unknown and how your study is actually going to fill that void and then that would pique my interest a lot more as well Yeah, echo the concise um, and the doing your homework. And if somebody mentioned the problem gap hook heuristic, and if you're not familiar with that, um, it is Lorelei Lingard's work. And if you just Google Lingard problem gap hook, you'll come up with a paper. And um, I think that that is a really, really great way to think about how to make your argument in an introduction concisely. And you just need to reference the specific literature that supports that problem gap hook. Um, oftentimes I see a lot of literature in the background or introduction that's not necessary. And so problem gap hook is my favorite. Honestly, anything by Laura Lee Lingard, if you look at it in, uh, in PMED, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, she's, a, so she's an education researcher, but also a, um, a literary scholar. And so she's very clever about how you can frame things, how you can use semicolons, and how to use quotes properly. And, there's short one to two page primers that really improve your writing. Um, I will echo, I agree 100% with everything the group has said thus far. One of my other things that I will often see um, that will usually raise a little bit of a red flag to me is if, it, they, if someone says this is novel and never been done before. Because nothing's ever been never done before, right? Things have been have evolved, they're unique, they have a novel angle, but usually there's something similar. And that's really where you situate your gap. You say, here's a prior study, Here's the thing I brought that's different. And the more that you can elucidate that, it speaks to you know, doing your homework, but it also better situates, OK, this is the gap. This is the unique angle that we're approaching here. And almost always there's a unique piece of it. No study is perfectly identical. But being conscious of, you know, find those prior studies, and then identify and call out, this is what I'm bringing to the table. This is why mine is a unique novel in the context of that prior work. All right, so you wrote this intro. Yeah, the reader's hooked. We're all interested. And we got to get to the methods section, which I think is the one that more commonly people are t prone to say, oh, I'm just going to skip the methods because it's like more painful, it's less, less interesting. I want to know the results. But the methods is what sells your paper. So what are the key elements of a methods section? What do you see specifically that tends to be left off or problematic in papers that don't get accepted? I think lack of clarity around methods. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about survey development, not describing how you developed your survey, how you validated your survey. 
I think is really important in, and in medical education literature, there's a lot of use of qualitative work. So making sure it is very clear um, how you plan to assess whatever your problem is that you put forward, um, I'd say those, that's a key part from my perspective. Yeah, I definitely agree, agree with the clarity. Remember, you want, you, know, you want the reader to be able to replicate this study just by reading the methods. Um, I think the other thing that I've noticed is if there are interesting decisions made in terms of your study design or your methods, I think providing a rationale for why you chose to do things that way is also important um, for understanding, again, and orienting the reader to, to what you did and why. I think those are phenomenal pearls. Um, it's always hard when you read modify and you're like, okay, well, how did you modify it and why? Um, and that helps you understand because um, it's not it's pretty common. In fact, almost no one does a real Delphi. Everyone modifies their Delphi. That's why I always say modify Delphi, but how you modify it is what matters. What did you do differently? How did you take an existing tool and you modify it? What did you do differently? That's, that's incredibly useful. Helps us understand how we can apply it for ourselves. All right, so we got through the intro, we got through the methods. You've I have a sense of what year we're going to do. And get the results. And results always seem so easy, because you're just like, I'm just going to report what I did. And you can, but there's results that are really easy to dive into, and there's some that are really painful. And you, at the end of it, you're like, I don't know what you found. So how do I delineate that? How do I best optimize my results to make sure that we actually can understand and use the data that you got? This is when the use of um, diagrams, charts, tables are really helpful. It should be simple for the readers to understand what the results were. And as much as you can put it in a pictorial view, the better. Um, I would say that's kind of the key take home from my perspective. I'll just say my pet peeve is, is when I see a lot of sort of um, more discussion and interpretation in the results section rather than in the discussion section. That really kind of just turns me off. <laughs> and again, in the um, spirit of brevity, um, not repeating things that you've di already displayed in a, in a text or a figure also in the text. Um, you can do one or the other. And then I think that step that Mike was alluding to of like taking a step back and really taking the time to absorb your results and think about it and think, what did I really find here and what's the most important part to present? It, you're usually not presenting all of your results, but you're presenting the most important ones. So taking the time to really process that before you start writing the discussion can be helpful in making sure that it makes sense in terms of the most important findings. And that visualization is so key. We don't often take advantage of it nearly as much as we should. And we're not always as broad as the options are. I think people, we tend to like bar charts because we're used to seeing bar charts. And that's our model. But there's a lot of more clever ways you can do things, like drop down analyses, you can do pie charts. Ultimately, look at the data and figure out how it can display in a way that makes sense, that allows me to compare it matching what I found. And it, so they've done some studies, and they look at comparisons of abstracts versus infographics. I'm going to use this as an analogy here and say, the abstract is very much text heavy. It's just here's everything we found. The infographic is the visualization of that. It's visually oriented. Which one do you think results in more people opening the paper? Who says abstracts read? Okay, who says the infographic? All right, excellent. Well, you're very good test takers and you know how the kind of game works. But yes, it is infographics. <laughs> um, it is a substantial increase in it because it comes down to we're visual learners. We want to see things. And ultimately, studies aren't about doing this study. It's about disseminating that knowledge. Yes, you do the study, but if you, you know, a tree falls in the forest and no one, no one hears it, it doesn't really matter. Well, environmentally, yes, but separate from that. In the context of the paper, if no one's able to see it, you can't disseminate it, people can't read it, well, that's a missed opportunity. And we have to keep in mind that the average reader of our study is not just those who are, live in our specialty and our sub-niche and those who are particularly interested in it. It's the broader end user. So we have to make sure that it's a way that other, anyone can understand it, even those who aren't hyper interested in our specific niche. And I think that's where the roles, roles can really pop with good, inf good visualization, thoughtful ways of disseminating it beyond just text. All right, so you got the results. It's visually appealing. Everyone's excited about that. Now you said, you know, Lynn, you said, we can't talk about interpretation and the results. So what do we do with the discussion now, group? I mean, I think in the 
discussion, that's what you want to see, right? You want to see the interpretation. You want to see how this situates into the context of the current literature and what is already known. And you want to leave readers with how they might take this and apply it going forward in their work and what steps need to be done in the future. I even suggest, you know, when you first start um, the idea of designing a study, go ahead and write your methods section, your discussion, even before you have your results. You should know what you're gonna come up with, or at least have some idea. You may be proven wrong, but um, you're doing the study because you think you're gonna get a certain result, typically. Um, so take the time then to do it, and then go back later, and then modify it. It's nice to step away from your work, give it time to kind of sit, and then um, reapproach it with a different lens. There's a lot of different formats and formulas for writing discussions, but I personally really like when authors just start off with not like repeating everything, but like this is what we found that was most surprising, interesting, or relevant. Just to kind of situate me as the reader in the like, okay, this is the this is like the take home message of the paper. Now I'm going to hear, as Jamie said, how this compares and contrasts with what we know and what the authors think it means, or how people might build off of it. It's, it's actually kind of hard sometimes because you're like, I want to describe everything we just saw, and there's a tendency to try to like just re replicate it. And so every time I catch myself doing that, I remind myself that a paragraph ago they just saw it. That's what the results was. So they just just saw that. So no one's forgetting it the, the, on discussion. And so when I start to find myself getting really granular in the discussion section, I'll actually turn it back and say, all right, they just saw this. I'm going to give a broad stroke statement and then contextualize it. Talk about what it means in the context of existing literature. What should we do with this information? How do we interpret this? That's my next job, because I'm coming as the writer. You're the expert in this topic, so how do you interpret the things you found? So, I actually want to call it one other thing that uh, Susan had a phenomenal point, which was writing discussion early. That's actually one of my favorite productivity hacks is if you're going to do a study in general, well, your intro and discussion, you could probably do it before you write the paper because that was your lit search to come up with the idea. That was effectively your IRB. And you can do it much earlier when everyone's got the maximum activation energy and everyone's really excited about your project. That's the perfect time when everyone's staying around waiting to start to write most of your paper. So I'm a big fan of kind of early writing of these things and like thinking about it and then coming back to it with a fresh lens and making sure that you don't, you know, that, that you can look at it again and say, okay, does this actually make sense with what I'm now seeing? It's like you're being your own peer reviewer in a sense. And so we're talking kind of in the lens of like the traditional original report, brief report, which is intro, methods, results, discussion. And then there's something called an innovation report. So who here has, first of all, who here has written innovation report? All right, we got two. Who here has seen an innovation report or heard of this term before? All right, we're sitting at about maybe 40% of the room. That's awesome. That's good. We can talk about this because I think it's a missed opportunity. As we spoke to earlier, some of that, how do you capitalize on the work you've already done? Innovation report is another really interesting lens. So what is an innovation report? And what are some of your pearls for how we can be successful if we're going to write one up? So an innovations report is describing something that you've developed or came up with um, and sharing a little bit about your experience with that. And then hopefully others will enjoy it, get excited about it, and go on and use it and you know, validate what you've innovated on. So usually they're short. Um, you don't necessarily have a lot of data about them. You have some. Um, but it really is kind of that little spark of something new and interesting to get people to want to do more of or maybe modify and further refine. I think about it as um, because you've had an amazing idea or you're the first person to do something, it's worth it to get it out there and we don't necessarily require the same amount of um, of outcomes that we would for a research report, a traditional research report. And so in that vein, because you're getting it out there, it's really important to include things like, here's all of the materials that I've created so that others can actually implement this at their site. 
here's the feasibility data. We kept track of what the time required was, the costs, the staff, and I'm gonna report that to you so you know if this is gonna be feasible to implement in your site. And here is user acceptability data in terms of, did the learners buy in? Did the faculty buy in? Was it sustainable? All of the things that you would wanna know if you were actually gonna implement this innovation, which is the goal. Um, I appreciate all the framework and obviously the information you're providing, but I'd also like to appreciate maybe what your thoughts are on obviously what's going on with AI and how we can kind of leverage that because you know all of us are going to use it. So um, I'm just being transparent. So um, obviously we want to use it in a smart way. Um, so what would you suggest and how can we obviously entertain putting that into our submissions? Yeah. Perfect timing. Um, tomorrow we have an editorial board meeting for AEM ENT, and that's on my list of topics to discuss. And tomorrow I'm doing the um, keynote session and really to start talking about what does AI mean to us when it comes to um, research. Jeff Klein, who's the editor of AEM, um, and I have had a few discussions about it. Currently, you know, we are going to start asking for any submission to the journals that SAM hosts, um, whether or not people have used AI or chat GBT um, in the development. That's where we're at right now. This is fairly new, right? You know, chat GPT, you know, debuted, kind of went public in November of last year, so not that long ago. Um, I, I think it's a work in evolution. I don't think people know exactly um, where we should go with it. We do know that, you know, big news um, uh, magazines, newscast things are actually using um, AI to write things, and then they actually have humans, um, you know, people that are the journalists to go back and kind of pull out snippets and kind of add um, where they think you need more clarity, et cetera. But it's new to us. I don't have the answer. Um, I, I, there will be a lot of work and talk about it um, as we move on through the next, I think, few years to kind of better define it. You know, how do you call something your own, right? When you write a paper, you say it's yours. Is it now yours, or does it belong to everyone? Um, I don't know. I think we're going to see a lot of issues around copyright as well, to that point. I think that this topic is really front and center for all of the meta journals right now. And like just in the last couple of months, uh, one of the editor groups I'm in, people have been posting, okay, here's this journal statement, here's this journal statement. So every journal is kind of having conversations about this. And so you can start looking to the author instructions, I think, for how explicit the requirements are right now for disclosing the role that um, any kind of AI had in your writing process. So I think it's a phenomenal question. The theme that I've heard commonly is it's transparency and boundaries. You have to disclose it. Most journals and the general representative societies have said you can't call them an author because chat GPT is not a human. It cannot take ownership. Um, it cannot take responsibility. Therefore, it won't meet the ICMG criteria. And most of us probably have horror to ridiculous stories of hallucinations of you know, references and statements that are clearly false, and it's going to evolve, it's getting better, there's versions that have access to the internet and can you know, stop making up some of the quotes and things. But I think there are really interesting things that come out of this that's probably going to end up being a more significant impact on us. Um, part of it is that it's going to, it should help reduce disparities. Those who come from other countries who don't speak English as a primary language are paying for editorial services to, to do that, and wouldn't that be great if ChatGPT Chat GPT or some other large language model could do that? Those who have you know, um, difficulty writing, who have less training in the specific writing area of it, who have dyslexia, could really benefit from this and get their, get their knowledge out there. And I think how we write, we write really scientifically. We write in a really complex way that no one in the public will largely understand without advanced training or a specific interest in our topic. And that does a disadvantage to the end users. And wouldn't it be great if we could have ChatGPT to write something at the level of a fifth grader? The same, we, same thing we do for informed consent. We say, you can't write this overly technical, no one will understand it. And then we write a paper that's overly technical that no one will understand. Wouldn't it be great if we could just use ChatGPT or something to actually disseminate this in a way that people could understand so that end users, not just us, but patients, 
health, poli health policy and politicians and those who may actually benefit from, you know, from the information we put out there can actually understand what we wrote and not in overly technical sense. There's all sorts of other things, but we only have so much time here, so that's probably a whole talk in of itself. So let me ask another question. So we've done our paper, right? We may or may not have used ChatGPT, but we did our paper and we put it together, we're really proud of it, and now where do I submit it to? How do I pick my journal? Um, I, I think, again, to you know, reading a lot and knowing which journals publish what types of things is, is probably a first and foremost. There's also collections. Uh, the WGEA actually puts out an annotated bibliography of venues that publish education and scholarship. So you can <coughs> reference that. They, I think they update it every two years. And it has just a, a nice summary of each journal, their targeted audience, what types of work they're published, any types of specific criteria they had. Um, so if you don't have someone you don't know right off the bat where you can submit, that's a really good reference to use. Yeah, it's a um, WGA annotated bibliography of. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. It's gonna. If you Google WGA annotated bibliography, the correct title I'm sure will come up. <laughs> I was informed I have to talk about my favorite one which is Jane, um, <clears throat> which is a journal, journal author name estimator. If you just Google Jane in journal, it'll show up. In short, you can like put in the abstract or the title. It will tell you a list of journals that would publish this likely. Super easy, really interesting, because all of a sudden journals that you know, I wouldn't have thought about will come to list. I'm just like, oh, that's really interesting. And I'll often screen the journals and say, yeah, you know what, this one's way off base, because it still is, it's a computer, it's not perfect. But sometimes I'll find ones that are perfect for it that I would not have thought of, and then it's another one you add to your arsenal. So we went ahead and we submitted to our first journal, and they sent us back revisions. How do we, I mean, you all receive revisions, well, you send out revisions a lot. And, you know, most of the time they're accepted. Sometimes they go back for additional rounds, sometimes they don't get accepted. What do you wish that we all knew about the revisions to make sure that we make the paper most likely to be accepted on that second round. I think one is just the whole shock value of accepting that revisions are very, very common. I remember the first time that I received my first decision letter with a whole list of revisions, I was just crushed. Um, and just recognize that that's normal, that's expected, it's actually designed to help you improve your work. In terms of really focusing, I, I would pay close attention to what the editor says in their, in their portion of the decision lever. They usually will give some guidance into what things they think are really important and they're gonna ultimately have the decision of whether your revised version gets accepted or not and what things you know are nice but maybe think about including but maybe not crucial um, in terms of really focusing where you put your effort on terms of that revision. Yeah, I always think of like the accept without revisions. It's kind of like the champagne tap of journal submissions. Zero RBC is like, wow, nothing. Reviewer two, silent. Um, <laughs> it's, it's always reviewer two. <laughs> it is. But most of the time you're going to get revisions. That it's, that's good. Because you know what? I'd rather have the revisions before it's published than later on when someone writes a letter to the editor saying, oh, you know, you didn't consider this. Right? It's a free pass. You're like, oh, great, I can fix this before it. You know, before it goes out and it gets disseminated, that's just like bonus information. And I would just kind of keep in mind that if I'm going to, you know, if you're getting revisions, just always make sure you respond to everything. Even if you disagree, you can say why you don't agree. If they totally misinterpret your paper, consider that maybe we just didn't write it clear enough and it's a good opportunity for us to write something clear. Or if they misinterpreted it, yeah, they misinterpreted it, I'm not going to make their change. But I might reflect on how I wrote it and maybe I wrote it in a way that other people who are not the expert, the reviewers selected because they're experts, may also misinterpret it. It's an opportunity for me to improve it. All right, so we're coming up in the, near the end of the talk, so let me, I'm gonna ask you all to share, what's one final, oh, can, can I just say one more thing? I, I, another thing about <coughs> responding to, to reviewers that I learned is I thought you had to do everything that each reviewer asked of you, and that's actually, I learned from these two ladies up here, it's not true. So if there is a, something that you disagree with, um, from, you know, from your soul after you've given it some thoughtful reflection, 
articulating a very nice response about why you disagree with that reviewer is perfectly acceptable too. So just, just keep that in mind as well. Notice the nice part. Be nice about your response because you want them to accept your paper. Um, it's okay to disagree, but make sure it's a professional collegial discussion about why. So the next time you get a revision from Dr. Yeris, Dr. Jordan, or Dr. Promise, remember they just said that. They said that it's okay to not answer every single comment as long as you respond appropriately. All right, so that being said, as we're kind of closing up the session, what's one final pearl or pitfall or something you'd like to share to help maximize the success of publication? I'm going to say the one I always say, and people laugh at me about it, but it's follow the instructions, right? There are different types of manuscripts. There are different journals that have different um, author guidelines. Um, and, and it's not uncommon. Sometimes a manuscript will be um, declined from one journal, and you want to turn it into another journal um, for um, see if they're interested in it. But please follow the instructions. They're there for a reason. Um, there's formats that each journal uses. You know. Um, and, and particular types of manuscripts. You know, there's different um, manuscript headings that you might be interested in that one journal offers and another doesn't. I'll say my pearl from a more of an author perspective rather than an, edit, an editor um, perspective. But start early, as we sort of mentioned before, and write often. I think sometimes if you let things get away with you and you've done everything and you just haven't written up the paper, it becomes very overwhelming. If you start early and do things chunk by chunk, it becomes much more of a manageable task and you'll be much more um, likely to have uh, a rapid succession of your publications. Um, my biggest tip for success is to become a peer reviewer. Because if you are a peer reviewer for a journal, you get this inside look at what the hot topics are, how the journal works. You learn so much from the other reviews and then the, the eventual editor decision. And becoming a peer reviewer is also a great way to get invited to write things like commentaries. Um, many journals um, pull from their top reviewers for editorial board position openings as well. So. Uh, very, very valuable experience for your own professional development, and it gives back. <laughs> uh, the last one, the editor is there to help you. So if you're looking at it and you see contradictory reviews or reviewer one and reviewer two disagree, a comment's really vague, you're not sure if it's something that's critical you address, it's entirely reasonable to reach out, and I have done that, I have been the recipient, of, I appreciate when someone reaches out and says, hey, I'm not sure how to address this, I, I don't understand what they're trying to get at. Because it's much actually faster for all of us, for you and for us, when we just have that conversation and say, okay, so here's how we can address this, here's, like, here's how I might frame this, or you know what, I, I see where you're coming from, I'm okay with that not being addressed. It saves all the back and forth, it makes things faster, it generally benefits everyone. So don't hesitate to reach out to the editor if there's a question on there that you're not sure how to address, because again, it benefits all of us. And so with that, I want to thank our amazing panel. Thank you for sharing your expertise and your time. Thank you all for being here.